this is going to be another key video as we really learn the basics of how to do a hypothesis test in this second video for chapter eight. And I begin by saying the following process that we're going to go and use uses a p-value approach in order to help us to make a decision. Historically speaking, the decision was binary. That is, our decision was a yes or no type. In other words, um, on whether the evidence was significant. We used to have this the critical value either falling into the rejection region or not falling into that rejection region. The p-value that you're going to see um, will help us to understand just how strong the evidence is for or against a null hypothesis claim. Now, that paragraph will make a lot more sense at the end of this video. So maybe you'll want to go back and reread that paragraph after we finished this chapter eight set of video lectures, because then that paragraph will really take on a new meaning. Now, anytime we do a hypothesis test, there will be five key steps. And I'm going to ask you to physically label them step one, two, three, four, and five, as I will always do. The first step we've already practiced stating the null and the alternate hypothesis. The second one will be based upon a significance level. Now, usually the significance level is given to you, but I will explain later how you will handle it if you are not given the significance level alpha. Then you're going to determine which test you're going to use, and then we're going to go straight into the calculator to find the test statistic and the p-value. And then we're going to make our decision whether we're going to reject HO or not. And then we're going to state our conclusion in words. Now, I want to call something to your attention right off the bat here. When you are making a decision, the decision is about HO. Are you going to reject it or not? The conclusion is always going to be about the alternate. Don't put HO in the conclusion. Don't make the decision about the alternate. It's very much a strict logic the way we're doing this. <clears throat> and I'm going to just tell you right now, if the significance level is ever missing, you can choose your own value. And usually alpha equals 5% is the default value that you go with, unless you are dealing with extremely important issues such as legal or medical matters, in which case we usually go with 0.01, a 1% significance level. And actually, I'm even starting to read articles that say, you know what? Let's even drop that down to 0.005 at times if it's a really crucial, critical value or issue we're dealing with. But 1% is what we're going to say. This is just the rumblings of what I'm starting to read a little bit in professional journals and on the internet. Okay, in making our decision, it says regarding HO in step four, we use these criteria. If P is smaller than alpha, we're going to reject HO. If P is greater than alpha, do not reject HO. Now, let's skip this next paragraph for a second because you're really just going to be mainly using this logic right here, which shows up inside of this table. Here's your criterion for the decision right here on the left. If P is less than alpha, reject HO. P greater than alpha, do not reject HO. But then your conclusion, this was step number four, your conclusion in words is going to then take on one of these phrases. If you reject HO, you're going to say the data seems to suggest that the alternate hypothesis is going to be true. Or you instead of seems to suggest, you might say strongly suggests. And there's no set rule on when you use one word versus the other, but for our class, we're going to say anytime our p-value is under 1%, we're going to go with the word strongly. And if it is still a rejection, but not under 1%, we're going to go with seems to suggest. But notice we then start talking about the alternate hypothesis. 
When you do not reject HO, the standard language we use is the data does not provide sufficient evidence to suggest that whatever the alternate hypothesis is, you steal those words from the problem itself. Now, this, what you see in the box, really is kind of a key part of this chapter. And as we start going on to the different problems, you're going to see me referencing that little cheat sheet, so to speak, along the way. Now, the paragraph we skipped over is what you do if you are not given a significance level. Okay, and it doesn't happen very often, or if you're making up your own problem in general and you don't know what to use, the default value is 5%. But if you're not given one, we say the following. If your P is under 1%, you're gonna definitely reject HO. And as I said moments ago, we're gonna call that a strong rejection. If your P value is under 1%, that'll just be a reject and we'll use the seems to language. And I probably should have said between 1% and 5%, but both of these are gonna be rejections. And then when your P value is greater than 5%, we'll say do not reject HO. Now those are just rules of thumb on what to do when alpha is not given to you. But for the most part, alpha will be given to you regularly. Okay, let's actually get an example in front of us. And when we have that example in front of us, it's gonna mean so much more. So here we go. In 1987, the mean verbal SAT score was 430 out of 800. Okay, that's back in 1987, a long time ago. Last year, a sample of 25 randomly selected scores was taken and here they are. You're gonna to want to right now, pause this video and type those into list one on your calculator. Then it asks the question and you always wanna zoom in on the question here. At the 10% significance level, stop, that tells us that alpha on step two is gonna be 10%. Okay, going back here, have SAT scores improved? Ah, key word, improved over the 1987 mean of 430 points. A well-written question will clue you to what the alternate hypothesis is going to be. So we are going to assume that the mean is still 413 for the verbal SAT score, and we're trying to show it is improved with a greater than 430, okay? Now we determine which test. Now for this chapter, it's pretty easy because you only have two choices. It's either the T test or the one proportion Z test, and we haven't even gotten there yet. But later on, this will become a bigger issue. So for us, this will be a T test. Now, when you go to your calculator, and I'm gonna do that right now, and you go into your calculator, stat over to test, our T test is choice number two. It's gonna ask you a couple things. First off, do you have your data in a list? We actually do, list one. And 430, I just happen to have there. Now notice where it says mu zero. That zero, think of it as going along with HO, H zero. It's the mean that you used in the null hypothesis. And then I'm just gonna go down here to the greater than, make sure it's highlighted and go down to calculate, and it does the hypothesis test for me. Now, if I didn't have that in the, this menu, and I were to go, if I didn't have a list of data and I just had a summary stats, watch what notice when I, what happens when I hit stats. When I hit stats, it says enter the mean, enter the standard deviation, et cetera, enter the sample size, and you have to get that out of the paragraph. But if you are given the list to type in, then you're just going with the data option instead. So when you do this on your calculator, you should be getting the following answers. Now here I've got it on 
what came off of my calculator, and but I actually rounded it to four places here and wrote it a little bit larger so you can see it on your screen there. We will again have a four digit rounding rule. Now that is my test statistic T. Later on, when we're dealing with proportions, that'll be a Z equals. And when we get to other types of tests, it will change to a chi squared or to an F or something else. But this is a T test. So the test statistic is a T value. We're not drawing a picture of a T curve. But basically, that 0.4889 says the sample data is about a half a standard deviation above the mean. If we were to have drawn a picture, and again, we're not, we'd say, okay, here's my picture. Here's the center. We're only just a little bit to the right of center. We're not really going to be off in rejection land left and right. But we're not using that picture. Instead, we're just going to be using the p-value to make our decision. So here is the criterion that we had a moment ago on when we're going to reject or not reject HO. We take this p-value, 0.314, and we compare it with alpha. Well, that p-value is greater than alpha. Since it's greater than alpha, we're going to say do not reject HO. So for step number four, we're physically going to write since p greater than alpha, do not reject HO. OK, that's all we do for the decision. Now, if you go back to what we looked at a little bit ago inside this box, we said when you do not reject and reject, this is how you word things. So I've taken that right here to remind us that when you do not reject HO, this is how we're going to use our how we're going to word our alternate hypothesis. We're going to begin with the phrasing. The data does not provide sufficient evidence that and then we're going to describe the alternate hypothesis that the mean verbal SAT scores have improved over the 1987 mean of 430. So the first half of this before the word that is exactly what I have up here before the word that. And the second half is basically the alternate hypothesis being described there. And I just stole the words right here, have SAT improved over the 1987 mean of 430. Okay, so steal those words. Now, when it comes to creating a confidence interval, find and interpret a 98% confidence interval for the mean verbal SAT last score, let score last year. Well, here we go. When you go in and do this, it'll be a T interval because we just did a T test and all those values will be already filled in on your calculator. And so when you do the T interval, this is what's gonna come out. And please verify this on your calculator now that those are the values you get. Now, how do you interpret this T interval? Well, that's what we learned in the last chapter. Here was that boilerplate language. We said we can be blank percent confident. Well, this will be 90% confident. So here we go. We can be 90% confident that, that what? The context, the mean verbal SAT scores have improved by some amount between, between what? between these two values, which were the values that came out. And I put the word points because we are measuring um, SAT scores in points. Okay, so this is basically how you do a hypothesis test. And the better you get at these basic ones, when they get more involved, these same exact processes are going to take place. So let's move on to another. A paint manufacturer claims that the average drying time for its new latex paint is two hours. Now, by the way, two hours, that's the same thing as 120 minutes. All your data is going to be in minutes down below. So I just wanted to make that connection. That's what their claim is, two hours. To test that claim, the drying times are obtained for 20 randomly selected cases of paint. And here are the drying times in minutes. 
and watch the way we've worded this hypothesis question. It begins with that same phrasing. Do the data provide sufficient evidence to conclude what? That the mean drawing time is greater than, aha, greater than the manufacturer's claim of 120 minutes. That's telling you what your alternate hypothesis is gonna be. So we've got HO, we're going to assume the mean is 120. Now I wrote mu zero here to kind of recommend or remind you that on your calculator, the HO and the mu comes, the mu zero comes from the H zero. But technically we don't usually write the zero there, we just write mu, but I wanted to make that connection with that's the number that you type into the calculator. Now our alternate is gonna have mu being greater than 120 minutes, greater than the two hours. And we were told to use alpha is 5%. So there's our step number two. Okay, at this point, you're gonna pause the video. If you haven't done so already, you're gonna type those numbers into your calculator. And because we're dealing with means with a single sample, you're gonna do a t-test. So please do that on your video, on your calculator right now, and then come back and let's check our answer for these calculator values. And when you do that, you find that, ah, the T value is point, or 1.3806. I guess I've cut off the P value, but it turns out to be 0 0.0917. Okay, that is just what comes out of the calculator. Now you need to make your decision. And again, I give you our little cheat sheet on what decision are we gonna make? We look at this p-value about 9%, and that is bigger than 5%. So it's that second line there. Since p is greater than our alpha, we're not gonna reject HO. And then we go back to that other little cheat sheet that had the blue box around it. And this is how we describe our alternate, our conclusion when we don't reject the null hypothesis. We're gonna say the data does not provide sufficient evidence to suggest that the mean drawing time is greater than the manufacturer's claim of 120 minutes. And I'm just stealing again the words directly from the problem. Because if your boss were to ask you a question, I want you to find this out. When you come back to him or her, you're gonna say, this is what I found out. You answer directly the question they're asking you. You don't go in there and just say, well, you know, I, you told me to research this, but you know, I researched this instead. You don't do that. The boss is going to say, no, go back and do it the way I told you to do it. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're answering the question as they asked it. Now, find a 90% confidence interval for the mean drying time of this new paint. Okay, well, we did a T test. Now we're doing a T, and whoops, we're doing a T interval. And so on our T interval, that's what should be coming out of your calculator. To interpret it, I'm reminding you here of our boilerplate language. And so we can be, well, this is a 90% problem. We can be 90% confident that the mean drawing time of the new paint is between 119.22 and 126.98 minutes. Now, this is a mean time that's between these two. Okay, let me just remind you that we're really dealing with the scientific method when we're dealing with a hypothesis test. If you went back to grade school and you had to do a hypothesis test, maybe junior high, you'd say, hey, here's what I'm trying to research. I'm trying to find out if such and such is true. You start with a hypothesis. You gather your data. And then after you've done this project, whatever it is, you look at the data and you say, do I have enough evidence to go with whatever I'm trying to show in my project? That's exactly what's being done here. There was a claim of two hours of paint drying time. They ran a sample. They did this experiment saying, hey, is this right or is it not right? Is the time greater? Does it take longer for the paint to dry than they're actually claiming? Okay, so that's the scientific method. 
Okay, now let's talk a little bit about what the heck is this p-value, okay? In a short, often it's referred to as the observed significance level of a hypothesis test. That's an, another way of describing the p-value. It is the probability within the rejection region to the right or left of the test statistic rather than to the left or right of the critical value. Now, here is a problem that it, it's a little bit harder to read. I'm gonna start with this picture and then draw one myself. But it used to be that, you know, here's my curve. I'm gonna draw it right above here. Here's the curve. And we used to say with this dotted line, here is my critical value. And if here is my alpha, we shade in here. And it was kind of a yes or no. Are we in this rejection region or not? Yes or no, reject. Now, if you're further into the rejection region, that's where the value of the test statistic goes. Instead of looking at the whole region, we look at just to the right of that value. And that area in shaded in blue is smaller than to the right of the dotted line. That tells you where, how far into the rejection region we really are. So I said quite often when we reject a null hypothesis, we find that the test statistic is far into the rejection region. The p-value process that we're using helps to denote this telling the reader of a hypothesis test just how strong the rejection actually was. So let me illustrate this my way. Here is a curve and here is the old way of doing it. We're saying, hey, if you're in this rejection region, we're gonna reject HO. But I'm gonna say, let's pretend that we're way off to the right here and that my critical value comes and my data lines up way over here instead. Now the blue part that I've shaded in is a whole lot smaller than the pink and blue combined. That's because we are far into that rejection region. Now, if I were going back to that past problem with the paint, if you wanted, if I told you, hey, the drawing time is longer than 120 minutes, you're gonna go, okay, I need to set some money aside. Time, time aside, but if I said, wow, it's really greater than 120 minutes, you know, you're going to need three hours instead of two hours for the paint to dry. Wouldn't you want to know that information that it's a strong rejection? Or if I go back to the raisin brand problem and say, you know, it was not just below 300, it was far below 300. They only gave us 150 raisins per box. That would be something we'd want to know. Instead of just yes or no, I reject or not hey, it was a strong rejection. Okay, now, it might be easier to think of a p-value in terms of confidence. For example, if your p-value was 0 0.035, which is smaller than 5%, usually it refers to a rejection. Then when you go one minus 0 0.035, you get 0.965. And basically you're switching from a significance to a confidence and it says, I can be 96.5% confident that whatever the alternate hypothesis is. When you start looking at professional journals, I probably should leave that there. But when you start looking at a biology journal or a psychology or sociology journal or a child development journal, and they're describing the results of a study, what they do is they say, la di da di da and they tell you something. And then after they make that assertion, they say, oh, P under 0 0.05. And then they say, further. And then they tell you more, they make another assertion along the way and they tell you whatever. And then they have parentheses, P less than 0 0.01. And by your reading that, you're gonna go, whoa, that was a significant finding. When P is under 1%, that tells me I can be more than 99% confident. Even if you go to look at some of those little things that come with medicine when you buy it, where they give you all that research stuff, you will see those p-values sometimes inside the, in the really tiny font, um, but it's there. So you can read on your own how strong is the evidence.
Now, what I've given you right here is something I'm on a couple of occasions going to show you so that this will make a little more sense to you. Okay, I want to kind of stop for a second and tell you a little bit of a story. I know this is a little cheesy and I'm breaking my pattern and this isn't on um, your lecture notes, but I want to give you a little story. A few years ago, I was on a plane with some of my math teacher colleagues, and we were coming back from a statistics conference, actually, and we were flying on Southwest Airlines, and they don't assign your seat ahead of time. So you want to get on there as early as you can to choose your seats. You want the aisles and the windows, and you don't want that dreaded seat with people on both sides of you. It's kind of a little weird, but that's what everybody does. They get on the plane as early as they can. So my colleagues and I got on the plane early and, you know, we got as close to the front of the plane as we could so we could get off quickly. But we also wanted our aisle and our window seats so we could actually chat. And then we knew there'd be an empty seat between us or some other unknown person. But that's what we chose to do. So we got on the plane early and we're watching the other people as they're coming down the aisle, um, getting on the plane. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, hmm, here's a guy in his mid 20s. Here's another guy in his mid 20s and another and another. And I'm going, where are the girls? Where are the grandmas? Where are the kids? Another guy in his mid 20s, another guy in his mid 20s. And I'm starting to go, this is weird inside my head, unspoken. Another guy in his mid 20s. And I actually leaned over to one of my colleagues sitting a couple seats away and I said, are you noticing this too? And I remember he said, yeah, we didn't even say what it was. Yeah. And no sooner did the microphone and the pilot come on, this is the pilot speaking, we'd like to welcome the infantry people from whatever Air Force group or Army group. They were going to be flying into Phoenix, which is where Southwest is centered. And they were going out into the desert to do some um, uh well, you know, where you jump out of an airplane practice type of runs. And so welcome these people aboard. And I went, ah, oh, that's why, you know, that's why we're seeing all these guys in their, um, in their mid twenties getting on the plane. Now I tell that story to you for a reason. Okay. I was noticing something funny was going on and I'm going to articulate what I was thinking. Whoops, let me not do that. I was thinking, could this have happened by chance alone? You know, something's going on here. Or was there some statistical significance? Was there a reason why we're seeing all their guy, these guys in their mid-20s coming on the plane? Okay, and so, huh, that's a little bit weird. So I was feeling something weird was going on. Okay, now. What, in order for me to show that that was statistically significant, I had that feeling something was going on here. I'm just saying things don't happen that way. In other words, the chance that that happened just by chance alone was really slim. That's what the p-value is, okay? And if we want to show statistical significance ever, we need to run a hypothesis test. Okay, I'm going to do one more thing with you. This is kind of strange, um, but I have the ability on my calculator to um, illustrate flipping a coin. So I'm going to go to our calculator right now. I'm going to quit out of this screen that we're in, and I'm going to show you how I would simulate flipping a coin. I'm going to hit my math button. I'm going to go over to probability. And I'm going to go down to rand int. And if I want to flip a coin, I usually want to choose a number between zero and one. And I'm just going to say do this one time. Now, what this does is it says I want to choose a number between zero and one. Zero to me would be heads because heads are round, and tails, if you think of a cat's tail, it's usually straight, like the number be my tails. So I'm going to do that. And if I now hit paste and hit enter and do that again, oh, it rolled a one. That was a tails. I roll again, tails again, a tails, a tails. Wow, what's happening here? 
there's a heads. I happen to get a bunch of tails in a row, whatever. And I can just keep hitting enter and it will flip a coin for me, heads versus tails. Okay, well, if we were in the classroom, I would kind of play around with this. And I actually have written a program for my calculator. It's called RAND. And I'm gonna run this program for you. And I would show you here that this program randomly generates values for heads, which are wins, and tails, which will be lost. And I'm gonna say press enter to flip a pretend coin. So I hit enter and it says, oops, it was a tail, you lose. And I wrote a one there saying that this has been done one time. So do I wanna try it again? Sure, okay. Oh, heads, I win, now my second trial. Okay, you got it? And what I would do if we were in class right now in a physical classroom is I'd come around from to each of you guys and I'd say, hmm, okay, we're gonna pretend you're guessing, flipping a coin, heads or tails, and sometimes I, break out a deck of cards and I go, you know, black versus red, you know, let's see if you're going to win or not. And so I go up to the first person. I say, let's see if you win or not. And we go up to person number one and, oh, they lost. Okay. There's one loss. Let's try the second person. Judy, your turn. Oh, you lost two. Let's go up to Jose. Oh, Jose, you just lost also. Let's move up to uh, Jessica. Oh, you lost Try another person. Oops, you lost, sorry. And let's try one more. Oops, you lost again. And at this point you realize, you know what, Mr. Toner, you've got this rigged and I've actually got this set up for everybody to lose. And then after 12, the game's over and it's done. I didn't actually have a random choice in there at all. I've actually created this event so that everybody would lose. Now, I know that's kind of stupid, but let me talk about what's going on. And I want you to ask you a question. When was it that you realized it was rigged? Okay. Now, a lot of people say, you know what? Here's person number one, two, three, four, five, six. A lot of people say, you know what? Right between the fourth and fifth person is where I started to go. Yeah, I think it's rigged. And then once that fifth loss came in, you went, yep, it's definitely rigged. And I can even hear in a classroom, the murmurs, where someone at right around number four goes, it's rigged. And then after five, the whole class is just chiming in. Oh, it's not. Okay, what's going on here? Each time you have a one half chance of heads, right? Of winning, a one half chance of winning, one half chance of winning, one half chance of winning or losing. After four trials, the tr probability of losing four times in a row is one out of 16, which is about 6%. Now, we're starting to go, hmm, a string of luck is kind of bad here. Once we get to that fifth person and we get one half again, and the probability we're going to get five in a row, multiplying together, we get one out of 32, which is about 3%. Okay, right between that 6% and 3% when people are going, something fishy is going on. Well, guess what? they're experiencing that p-value. They're going something strange here. This couldn't have happened by chance alone. Something was involved to make it happen this way. And that's why we use generally a 5% significance level. Psychologists have found that right around that value is where we start to go, eh, something's not right. That's what this p-value is. And I wanted to give you a little bit of an explanation and in just kind of a mild way, have you experience it yourself, okay? Let's continue on here with another example because I really want this to lock in, but I wanted to take a little break there from it to understand the p-value. Now for this next problem, again, I need you to pause this at some point and type in these 12 numbers. And let's take a read here. A light bulb manufacturer advertises the average lifetime for its light bulbs is 600 hours. That's their claim. 
a random sample of 12 light bulbs resulted in the following data in hours. Assume the light bulb lives are normally distributed. That's a good sentence to have there because when we're doing T tests, we actually need to have samples that are larger than 30 because if they're not larger than 30, we're supposed to test the normality. So at the 5% significance level, do the data provide evidence that the mean life differs, there's that key word, differs from the advertised mean. So in our null hypothesis, we're going to assume the mean life is 600 year, uh, years, hours, and we're going to show alternately that it differs. There's that key word that tells us we're going to use a not equal to. In step number two, they said to do this at 5% significance level. So alpha is going to be 0 0.05. Now, which test? I know you know that this is a t-test. That's all we've been doing, but I'm getting you into this pattern because this pattern is going to stay for the next couple chapters. So you're going to the calculator. You're going into the t-test. You've got the data in a list. And when you do that on your calculator, whoa, I just messed that up. When you do that on your calculator, here's the screen that comes out. And that should match what's sitting on your screen right now. So here's your T value and your P value. Now notice that the P value is 0 0.0309 and it's smaller than alpha. This is our first P less than alpha problem. The first two problems we did were both do not reject. This one is one that says we're going to reject HO. Okay, so here's how we're doing it, 3% under for the 5% limit. So now we go and we look at how do we word our conclusion. When we reject HO, we're going to say the data, and we have a choice of seems to suggest or strongly suggests. Now we use the word strongly when P is under 1%. Our P is not under 1%, so we're going to use the words seems to. So here we go. The data seems to suggest that the mean life for the company's light bulb differs from the advertised mean. Okay. And a couple comments I have over here at the side. When we get this p-value of 0 0.0309, what does this mean? Well, if you go 1 minus 0 0.0309, you guys know that significance and confidence add up to 100%. And the p-value is the observed significance level. Okay, that was that alternate definition, the observed significance level. Yes, you have the significance level of 5%, but the observed one is the 0 0.039. So if we subtract that from 1 or 100%, we get to this 0.9691. This means we can actually be 96.91% confident that the mean life for the light bulbs differs from the advertised mean. Now, I want to say here that we wanted to be 95% confident. Where does that 95% come from? That comes from up here in the original problem. When they said, do this with a 5% significance level, that means we want you to be 95% sure in what you're telling us if you're going to be rejecting HO. So we wanted to be 95% confident in our alternate hypothesis, but instead we were actually 96.91% confident. We actually ended up coming in at a higher level of confidence. Now, I'm not going to show you this too many times, so this is a good time right now to make sure you really understand it. And I know I had an extra little H showing there on the screen, so my apology there that I have a little extra H. But that's really a key concept. Okay, continuing on. 
yet another problem. And if you want to pause and type in these 38 numbers into a list, and I'm going to actually ask you this time, try and do the whole hypothesis test all the way through, if you could please. And let's see if this is really sinking in. So please pause your video now and do the whole thing on your own. Okay. A football league reported the average number of touchdowns per game in 1988 was seven. Okay, that's what we're starting with is seven, average number of touchdown game and per game. The number of touchdowns per game for 38 randomly selected games played this year is, and here's our data. Do these values suggest that the average number of touchdown per game, mu, has decreased from the mean back in 1988, which was seven. Perform this at a 5% significance level and assume the data is normally distributed. So I'm hoping you just nailed this one, okay? First off, mu equals seven, mu less than seven. I know it's less than seven because of the word decreased. Has it decreased? The significance level was 5%. That is our value of alpha. You know this is going to be a t-test. And when you type these in and you crank, oh darn it, there we go again. And you cranked it out in your calculator. These are the values you should have received. Your test statistic rounded to four places was negative 3.0202. And your p-value rounded to four places was 0 0.0023. OK, again, this p-value is smaller than alpha. So less than alpha tells us we're going to reject HO. But this time, since our p is so small, it's under 1%, we're going to use the word strongly, the data strongly suggests that the average number of touchdown per game has decreased, I can spell, de I spelled decreased wrong, I'm sorry, from the 1988 mean of seven. Okay, now I got another parenthetical comment over here at the right. If you take that p-value, one minus that 0 0.0023, we get 0.9977. It says this means we can actually be 99.77% confident that the mean has decreased. Back at the beginning, it said we needed to be 95% confident. Now, we could have just said, yeah, we are 95% confident. But by looking at this p-value and saying, whoa, we can be 99.77% confident, that's a really strong finding. There's the value of using this p-value approach for our hypothesis tests. OK, now we're going to change gears a little bit and move on to proportions. But once you know how to do all this with means, it's just a simple changeover for doing these with proportions. So here we go, the assumptions. Now, we're not going to be checking these assumptions on these problems, but I'm just going to state them right out here. Right off the bat, n times p and n times 1 minus p should both be about or greater than or equal to 10. We're assuming that when we're doing these proportion problems that we've got simple random samples, and we need to assume that the individual samples that we take are independent of each other. That's just kind of the key assumptions. But again, I have to pick and choose which assumptions we're going to check. I'm choosing to emphasize the normality assumptions on the t-test more so. And you'll see when you start into the homework, we're going to work with that a little bit. These steps that you see here are exactly the same steps we had for the previous t-test. So let's go into our first problem. A college is considering construction of a new parking lot because it feels that at least 60% of all students drive to campus. Okay. Hmm. If a random sample of 250 students contains 165 drivers, can the administration's claim be rejected at a 3% level of significance? Now, comment, our sample data was 165, 
out of 250. When you can use that this many out of that many, survey says, you know that you're dealing with a sample proportion and you have your X over N listed right here. So now we move on to our hypotheses and we've got to be careful that we're using P for proportion instead of mu for mean. The claim was that at least 60 people sorry, 60% of all the students drive. That would be 60 or greater. Now I would go with greater than or equal to, but I just went with a greater than because the equal to would still go up with the, the null hypothesis. So we're trying to show that there's more here, okay? Now our significance level, again, this is a weird one. They said go with 3%, oh, well, you know, that's just, we don't have to stick with 5% or 1%, so 3% for this problem. And because we're dealing with proportions, we're gonna do the one prop Z test. Now, this is the easiest calculation, one a hypothesis to use on your calculator, because when you go into your menu, it's gonna ask for X, it's gonna ask for N, and it's gonna ask you for what is PO. And then it's going to ask you for the inequality. So you're just going to say 165, 250. Our P0 is going to be 0 0.6. The P0 comes from the H0. And then you're going to choose greater than. And that's it. You're going to enter those four features into your calculator. And when you do that, and if you want to pause and check this on your calculator right now, that would be a good move. When you do this, here are the values that should come out, okay? 1.9365, that nine's gonna round the four up to a five, and your p-value 0 0.0264. Now we're gonna do exactly what we've done before, and I don't have the little cheat sheet listed here, but we're gonna say, since our p-value is less than alpha, we're gonna reject the null hypothesis, Okay, and then when we choose the wording for our reject, we're not going to say strongly. Our p-value is not under 1%. So we're going to say seems to suggest. The data seems to suggest that at least 60% of students drive to campus. Okay. When it comes to the confidence intervals, I'm going to remind you here of the wording we used for our confidence intervals. We can be blank percent confident that context is between this and this percent in this case. Okay, it says find a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of students who drive to campus. Okay, well, you just did a one proportion Z test, so you're going to do a one proportion Z interval now. And when you type that into your calculator, you're going to get point. 60128 up to 0.71872. Now, when you now convert this into an interpretation using this language over here at the left, which I'll move right here now, so it's right next to what we're doing, we're going to say we can be 95% confident. Whoops, I said 95. Well, they did say 95% confidence. I was thinking of that 3% up here, but that the proportion of students who drove, drive to campus is between, and notice I changed it from a decimal mode to a percent mode. I moved the decimal two places over in order to do that. Our brain, if we say the percentage is between here and here, we want percentages that is between, not decimals that is between. So you really do need to write that one in terms of percentages, moving the decimals over. Okay, let's do one more example, and then we'll leave you to your homework at that point. In this final example, it says a survey of 379 people who viewed the Reagan-Mondale debate back in 1984 resulted in 205 who thought Mondale won the debate. You can see how old this problem is. This was actually a problem I took from my statistics first class back in 1984, when the teacher was making that a brand new problem. And I thought, you know what, this is a great problem. I'm just gonna use the one that was from my class way back when. 
thought you'd enjoy knowing about that. So with 5%, can we infer that a majority of all registered voters who watched the debate also th thought Mondale did better? Okay, what does it mean to have a majority? That means more than half, more than 50%. And we're dealing with proportions here. So we assume that it's pretty much an even debate. The 50% would, would go for each candidate, but we're trying to show that more than 50%, that the P, the proportion who voted or thought Mondale did better was greater than 50%, 0.5. They asked us to do this at a 5% significance level. So alpha is gonna be 0.05. And because we're dealing with proportions, this is gonna be the one proportion Z test. So you're gonna go into your calculator. It's gonna ask for your PO, which will be 0.5. It's gonna ask for X and N, which will be 205 and 379. It's gonna ask for your inequality, which will be greater than. And when you do that, out comes this Z and P value. And I really encourage you to stop the video and check that on your own. And then we look at that P value and you go, oh my gosh, that's pretty close to 5%, almost a rejection, but not quite. So since our P is bigger than alpha, do not reject HO and the data does not provide sufficient evidence to suggest that the majority of all registered voters thought Mondale did better. And I, sorry, I have some abbreviations there. Now, what is the confidence interval? Find and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion based upon our sample survey for the proportion of all registered voters who thought that Mondale did better. So we did, again, a one proportion Z test at the left. We're gonna do a one proportion Z interval over here at the right. And these are the percentages you're gonna see here. And here's our little cheat sheet for how we word these conclusions. And so we are gonna say we can be 95% confident that the proportion of registered voters who thought Mondale did better is between 49 to 59%. Notice I changed those decimals and growth them as a percentage. Almost the entire interval is over 50%. It's really leaning towards that 59%, but it's not quite there. And that's why we weren't actually to make that claim back over here on the hypothesis test that said a majority did think. We didn't quite have enough information. And that is actually showing itself over in this confidence interval also.